All right, so we're hitting noon here and I have an intro to do. So if you do happen to be joining late, you're not gonna miss much from uh, my introduction. You won't miss any of the value here that we're, we're gonna be sharing today. So good afternoon all, my name is Adam Van Babel. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're really excited today. The event Fueling an Innovation Ecosystem for Startups to Thrive. And thank you to the panelists for sharing your time and insight with us all here today. We're joined by some of the region's brightest minds to discuss innovation ecosystem and helping startups succeed in the biohealth capital region. This event series, for those of you who might not have uh, participated in past events we've held at BioBuzz, was created to be a resource for the region, and we call it Talent Buzz. If you're unfamiliar with BioBuzz, we share stories about the people and companies making an impact in the region, and you're going to hear today all about uh, the regional innovation ecosystem and some of those great stories that our panelists are going to share with you. So today's event is also sponsored by Workforce Genetics. It's our recruiting and talent attraction arm. So if you're struggling to recruit great talent to your company, you're not alone. We're here to help you. There is a better way. Please reach out to us. So before we begin, I wanted to mention some housekeeping notes. I know that everyone at this point is well familiar with Zoom, but we're big fans of engagement here. And all participants are encouraged to utilize chat throughout the event communicate with each other, with our panelists. We'll also be answering Q&A live with the questions and some of them being held for discussion at the end of the event. With that being said, I'm pleased to introduce Rich Bendis. Rich is the founder, president, uh, CEO of BioHealth Innovation. He's a successful entrepreneur, corporate executive, angel investor, investment banker, innovation, technology-based economic development leader, speaker, consultant, the list goes on. He serves as the founding president and CEO of Innovation America, which is a national public-private partnership focused on accelerating growth in the innovation economy in America. Knowing that, Rich is our go-to expert who will be moderating today's event. With that, Rich, take it away. Adam, thank you very much. And I don't know about the brightest minds. I think they follow everybody uh, in the introductions that I'm going to be making here. Um, but I appreciate uh, BioBuzz and Workforce Genetics in sponsoring an event like this because during these times, I think it's good to give exposure to uh, people, entrepreneurs, scientists, and businesses within our region to the resources that are available to help support them. And we do have a world-class panel today uh, to provide information as to what we need to do to fuel the biohealth capital region to keep it growing, as well as, as to continue to support the companies within our ecosystem. So I will talk a little bit later about some of the programs of biohealth innovation. But right now, uh, I want to mention also that Adam uh, is going to be doing a poll with a couple questions that will be running continuously throughout the next hour of this webinar. And the uh, attendees can answer these two questions at their leisure. And then we will give the results of these two questions at the end of the webinar uh, for all of those who have responded to those questions. So I wanna, wanna kick it off by doing a uh, brief introduction of our panelists. And then I will let each of them introduce themselves and their companies and some of the basic programs and services that they offer in their words rather than in my words. So I'm gonna start with Sally Elaine, who is the head of J Labs in Washington, DC, a new uh, entry into our marketplace this year uh, and a great addition to the BioHealth Capital Region. Sally, welcome to the panel Thank and you. to the BioHealth Capital Region. Yeah. Thanks, Rich, and, and thanks for having me on today. So a quick introduction, I am the head of J Labs at Washington, DC. We are part of the Johnson & Johnson Innovation family. Uh, we have landed here and will be opening uh, early in 2021 at the new Children's National Innovation Campus in Northwest DC. Uh, so we are a no strings attached incubator. Uh, we move into ecosystems where we see some of the greatest science and technology, um, biotech and biohealthcare startups and entrepreneurs and we certainly recognize that in, in this DMV region. And J Labs at Washington, D.C. will be our 13th J Lab site. 
Great, thank you. Great addition to the region. Um, our next panelist is Chris Barrow, Executive Director of Life Sciences at JP Morgan, and a frequent visitor to our region and thinks it's one of the most robust regions in the United States, right, Chris? Absolutely, Rich. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, I'm Chris Barrow. I lead JP Morgan's Life Science Middle Atlantic Corporate Banking Practice. What does that mean exactly? We're, we're targeting companies that are being translated out of universities all the way to uh, public companies that have market caps of $2 billion. Um, our spectrum in terms of life sciences is a pretty wide. It's, it's CROs, CDMOs, spec pharma, generic, med device, diagnostic, and therapeutics. Um, the reason why, you know, JP Morgan decided to put a, a, you know, a group of people in the middle Atlantic is just because of all the great institutions and the great research coming out of the middle Atlantic. And uh, we're here to support it in any way we can. Thank you, Chris. We'll talk a lot more about J.P. Morgan later. Our next panelist is Kalela Eskadanian, uh, who's the Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer at Children's National Hospital and a great partner for all of us. So, Kalela, welcome. Thank you, Rich. Uh, um, as Rich mentioned, I'm uh, with Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., and uh, Children's National has a very strong uh, research and innovation arm uh, focusing on five areas of cancer and immunology, neuroscience research, uh, genetic medicine, translational science and investigational therapeutics and uh, device innovation, all focused on uh, the pediatric unmet uh, needs in the market. And uh, we are very proud to be partnering both with uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Innovation J Labs, as well as BioHealth Innovation um, to make sure that promising uh, research that initiate from our research labs uh, can make it to the market and, and or provide direct benefits to our own clinics at Children's National. Thank you, Kalela. We look forward to learning more. And uh, last but not least, we have Artie Santanam, uh, who's the executive director at the Maryland Innovation Initiative at TEDCO. Artie is uh, ever present at events throughout the region. Artie, uh, welcome to the panel. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rich. Um, so I work at TEDCO. TEDCO is uh, instrumentality of the state of Maryland. We've been in existence for about 21, 22 years now. And what we do is we um, find, invest in, and grow um, tech-based startup companies in Maryland. Uh, the Maryland Innovation Initiative that I run is one of many programs under the TEDCO umbrella. And uh, MI specifically looks at technologies in the five major universities in Maryland and helps commercialize and accelerate the technologies from bench to the market. Thank you. And TEDCO has been a friend to all for many years. So uh, don't forget, there's a poll that you can participate in that will be running throughout this webinar with a few questions, and then we'll give you the results at the end, which Adam will give you. So let's get rolling here. And, you know, we're all right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I, I would imagine a lot of our listeners uh, on this webinar are interested to know how has this pandemic impacted what you do on a daily basis uh, as well as a part of servicing the biohealth capital region and the companies in this region, as well as the companies you work with nationally, if you do that on a national basis. And uh, we'll start again with Sally and we'll work our way around uh, on that question, Sally. Yeah, so it's, I think it's been a shift for all of us, um, whether our, our strategic business plans um, have been slightly altered uh, or um, optimized in some regards when we look at our portfolio. Um, so for us here in, in DC, um, I'd like to start with saying we are on track still to open at the Innovation Campus. We haven't seen a big delay, which has been uh, truly fortunate, and, and we thank those frontline construction workers that are, are building our, our new site. Um, in regards to our full JLabs portfolio, when we look across globally, it's really been an opportunity to um, take some of our companies that forward um, working on uh, devices and technology um, in, in the space of responding to COVID. So we've been able to support those companies in the portfolio with different mechanisms of funding. 
Um, we have a, as you know, Rich, we have a uh, also a multi-year partnership with BARDA that was signed uh, last year. And, and we're looking at ways in which we can optimize that partnership uh, with some of our portfolio companies uh, with additional access uh, to support funding to move technologies forward in, in response to COVID. So, so I'd say for locally, our business plan is, is still on track. Um, we've been working across our portfolio to enhance um, access uh, of sources of funding for our startups and, and those working in the COVID space, I think have been able to um, ha build on an opportunity on their science and technology. And I guess it was serendipitous to establish the relationship with the BARDA Innovation Center well before the COVID-19 mm -hmm. ever hit and who knew how strategic that was going to be, Sally? Yeah, you know, I think it's fair to say we always, those of us in the science space knew there was a respiratory virus that was going to come and impact us greatly. Um, and yes, I, we would say we're opportunistic in, in signing this well-needed partnership with, with BARDA under the time of Rick Bright's leadership, which we know we are continually well, continuing forward well with, with Gary Dislow at, at the helm. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important and it's important to recognize from that and other partnerships that have been put in place since COVID, um, the importance of public and private partnerships to drive science and, and innovation. We may come back and revisit that, but uh, thank you. Chris, uh, let's talk a little bit about the investment banking world, the climate, the IPO markets, venture capital and investments from a JP Morgan perspective. So, you know, I'm, we're fortunate to work in life sciences. The, the IPO market took a little bit of a dip right after everyone shut down, but it's been on fire ever since. Um, the first half of the year, we, we've done over $11 billion in IPO, the IPO market. That's compared to roughly $17 billion for the whole year of last year. Uh, the follow-on market has been equally strong. Um, the VC market, uh, they have capital. They need the capital. To, they need to deploy that capital. So uh, companies that were in conversations are still having those conversations and getting funded. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's been a robust environment. Uh, the only thing that's shifted is we're no longer working from our office. We're working from home. Um, and the one thing that we miss is that, you know, in-person contact. But that hasn't stopped business. Um, um, we're, we're constantly discussing with startups, constantly discussing with uh, companies that are, are seeking Series A, Series B funding. Um, and it's, 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 uh, it's, been, it's been a good spot to be in. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about specifically uh, J.P. Morgan and the biohealth capital region a little bit later. But that's sort of more of a national perspective. Thank you for that. Yeah, no uh, yeah, Kalela uh, with Children's National, who's really been the anchor. Uh, we were looking for an anchor in the biohealth capital region since there's not a lot of pharma companies located there. And what's, what's happened over the last three years is Children's National stepped up to be sort of the lead ecosystem builder uh, in the District of Columbia. So Kalela, let's talk a little bit about what you, what's happening with your institution and the ecosystem in D.C. around Children's during this pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Um, so um, Children's National, as you know, was one of uh, the first sites um, in the region and the f first in the District of Columbia that established the drive-through um, uh, curbside uh, COVID test uh, for the district, uh, which at the beginning was um, uh, limited for our patients and employees. Um, but we were very fast to uh, react and um, be ready uh, for this um, uh, to address um, the issues that uh, come with the pandemic. Um, with respect to research, obviously, we had to limit um, basic science research and the lab use to COVID-related activities only. So we saw a um, very sharp drop in act activities in the lab space. Um, but also, uh, our clinical trials um, 
infrastructure was impacted because we had to cancel um, and delay many clinical trials and limit those again to COVID related uh, trials. So now we are slowly picking up uh, reopening. Uh, we are in our phase two um, uh, reopening. Uh, our, uh, research labs are uh, operational uh, on a 25% basis right now, and uh, we uh, evaluate that on a weekly basis to see how safely we can uh, reopen the rest of the operation. Uh, clinical trials have picked up as well. Um, so um, we want to do continue research in a, a safe manner so these measures are necessary. However, um, most of our researchers uh, worked from home uh, during the pandemic, so they had the opportunity to catch up on manuscripts and write uh, grant applications. Uh, so that was uh, a necessary uh, break as well. And, you know, uh, if there is any silver lining in this pandemic, you know, that might be one uh, that we appreciated. Um, uh, as far as uh, for our clinical operation, uh, we had a very good telemedicine infrastructure in place even before the pandemic started, which at that time was mainly focused on provider to provider services um, on an international basis. So we uh, quickly adapted that to provider to provider and provider to consumer uh, service. So from the month of March to April, we had uh, a surge of 2,400% increase in our telemedicine volume. Um, and, you know, there's some practices that we would like to keep even post pandemic and we, maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but that's the second silver lining if there is any in this pandemic that uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, Kalala. We'll come back and visit some of the other uh, areas that you had just mentioned later. Uh, lastly, we'll talk to Artie here with TEDCO. Talk a little bit about what's going on with the TEDCO ecosystem and environment and programs during the pandemic, Artie. So this, this situation has been both a challenge and an opportunity for TEDCO and uh, our, our portfolio of companies and um, um, the scientists in the participating universities. Um, a lot of that has been relied on what our needs are from the State Department, State Department of Commerce, as well as Emergency Department, um, Response Departments. Uh, a lot of our projects that were able to use it as an opportunity were looking at um, quickly pivoting from what they were doing, which was medical device manufacturing, to manufacture respiratory um, valves or masks or shields and PPE devices, as well as some of our diagnostics that we're able to quickly pivot to look for diagnostic um, for COVID-related diseases, right? So uh, that has been an opportunity for them. The challenge has been for the uh, scientists in the universities to keep their research going. And uh, the labs have been closed. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a hard... Um, um, Pat coming back and ramping up and getting those projects done and moving those technologies forward. Just because we have COVID doesn't mean that we don't need oncology and neuro uh, neurological, uh, you know, therapeutics and things like that. So we have to be moving those along as well. So that has been a challenge and we are trying to help them as much as we can. We are giving them extra funding and, you know, extensions and all of the things that NIH does for the researchers, as well as what we can do in terms of bolstering their workforce as well. Thank you, Artie. Um, you know, the title of this is Fueling an Innovation Ecosystem for Startups to Thrive, really, in the Biohealth Capital Region. So the question I want to ask to the panelists next is, uh, what are the programs for startups or early stage companies that uh, your organizations have, and uh, more importantly, how do they get engaged with trying to interact with your organization? And uh, let's start again. Uh, I'm gonna, we'll go to Sally second this time. We'll start with Chris first, and then we'll come back and rotate a little bit here. Thanks, Rich. Um, so it, it's pretty simple, right? Uh, the questions most uh, startup companies ask us is, does JP Morgan invest in startup companies? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, but what we do have is we have a Rolodex of, of potential funders. 
So uh, a, a startup company comes in, we int gets introduced and says, we need to raise $5 million. Well, depending on the type of area, if it's med device, is it therapeutic, and what type of therapeutic they're chasing after, we have a bunch of investors that we'll introduce them to. So, um, you know, it, 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 it's, 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 it's more of connecting the dots versus pure JP Morgan involvement. And we're just trying to help the ecosystem grow. So that's why we talk to Artie all the time, trying to figure out which companies are coming out and moving forward. That's why we talk to you, Rich, to keep moving, you know, new companies through the system. Um, because we, we want we want the next uh, Novavax, you know, or emergent bio, bio, uh, um, bio uh, emergent to come out or, or, or Paragon Bioservices. You know, those are the companies that have evolved out of out of the region and have grown to be you know, terrific national global um, companies. And that's where we're trying to help. Great. Thank you. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other activities you partner in. And I think one thing that can't be missed is that even if you can't help them directly, you are very good at providing introductions to people that may be able to support startups. So it's not like you're invisible, Chris, at JP Morgan, because you're at a higher tier. You, are, you want to engage as early as possible so you can develop those relationships earlier. Spot on. I couldn't okay. say that. Said that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Sally, let's talk about uh, J-Labs and uh, the types of programs and how do people uh, try to engage with you directly? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we are a no strings attached incubator. So we are sourcing the best science and technology uh, that is on strategy for Johnson & Johnson or is so transformational, uh, we think it's incredibly important to be connected. So it's as simple as an online application. Uh, so you can go to our, our website, uh, start a uh, application, which is really consists of um, non-confidential information, your pitch deck, your company uh, detail, and then it goes internally for us to review. Um, and this is where I really partner across Johnson & Johnson's experts within uh, the specific space or therapeutic area or sector, um, you know, we are qu quite a diverse um, healthcare company. We are in not only pharmaceuticals, but also medical device and consumer uh, products um, and uh, technologies. So it's, it's a wide net. Uh, we work internally uh, to review those applications and have a selection committee. Um, in doing that, I'm also partnering uh, with uh, sector experts and sector leads that are driving um, sourcing of internal uh, technology and science needs for all of our sectors and therapeutic areas. And I partner with um, our business partners in Boston, the Boston Innovation Centers. So as we look at companies and, and opportunities, not only are we interested for J Labs to bring you into the incubator, um, but also for potential partnering with Johnson & Johnson. So we, we look at all aspects of a company and an opportunity. When you become part of our uh, incubator, you are given a mentor within J&J. &J. So how can we provide you the expertise uh, that you need to move your science and technology forward faster? Um, and in doing so, we also wanna make sure that you really put your capital towards your research and development. So how can we get the resource to, resources that you need? So we have a very large resource hub we also have a very large investor hub. So for all of our J-Labs companies, uh, we have an investor hub that's powered by JJDC, which is our strategic um, investment arm within Johnson & Johnson. But we also have 125 other companies uh, for in, that are doing investments. Uh, so that's also another aspect. And then we do a, a very large uh, programming um, piece to our business model. So as we move into the ecosystem, um, as I know a lot of people have experienced, uh, we partner across the ecosystem on science thought topics, on business topics, on um, IP, on pitch events, whatever we can do to really drive the conversation, just like we're having today um, with those across the region. Thanks, Sally. I have some other follow-up questions. We'll get to those uh, in the ne next segment. Uh, Kalela, um, you know, you, you've got a specialty with children's and pediatric uh, science, technology, uh, and care. Uh, I guess the question becomes, 
uh, how do companies that are not inside of children's or research inside of children's affiliate or partner with children's? Because I know one of our client companies is from Kansas City and is partnering with children's in Washington, D.C. So I, I, I would like the listeners to know that uh, you're, you're more of an open innovation environment rather than closed only to the children's environment. So could you expand on that a little bit, please? Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, uh, so we do that both uh, in an organic fashion and also in a structured fashion. So I, I will start with the uh, start structured. So uh, we are one of the five consortia uh, in the country uh, that has been designated as Center of Excellence uh, for Pediatric Device Innovation by the FDA. And we have a grant uh, from the Office of Orphan Products, uh, which helped us establish the National Capital Consortium for pediatric device innovation. Uh, so this consortium, as you mentioned, is very um, open uh, to uh, help startup companies um, no matter where they are. Uh, so we source and scout uh, the best pediatric device ideas uh, around the world. Uh, we have um, an annual uh, pitch competition that uh, we select the finalists through a very rigorous uh, selection process uh, for these companies to come and pitch their their pediatric uh, device idea to then be selected for funding support uh, up to fifty thousand um, uh, dollars per company um, as well as um, uh, putting them through a pediatric accelerator program uh, focused on uh, device innovation. Uh, for that, we partner with a group out of uh, uh, Los Angeles called uh, the MedTech Innovator. Uh, so uh, together we established the Pediatric uh, Device Innovation Accelerator Program that is an adjacent uh, program to the existing accelerator that uh, Medi uh, MedTech Innovator already had. So in addition to funding, companies also receive the benefit of getting connected to medical device experts, um, network of investors, and um, really um, uh, help them, uh, groom them with all aspects of uh, regulations, reimbursement, uh, clinical trials, and everything that they need to bring that device uh, through FDA clearance uh, successfully. Uh, so that's one way uh, to engage with Children's National through um, the National Capital Consortium for Pediatric Device Innovation. And that is focused on medical devices. Uh, but for biotech companies, um, uh, we uh, have a partnership with BioHealth uh, Innovation um, through the uh, Entrepreneur in Residence Program that have helped uh, actually uh, some of our investigators to get connected to uh, uh, biotech companies or startups uh, in the region. And the opportunity is uh, together go after STTR, SBIR type of uh, funding opportunities that um, uh, we do that uh, very willingly. Uh, with companies in the region and anyone who wants to work with Children's National in the five areas that I mentioned um, at the beginning, uh, cancer immunology, neuroscience, genetic medicine, medical devices, and investigational therapeutics. Great. Thank you. That's a, that's a good summary of some of the basic uh, programs you have available. And also, people from outside the region can also partner with children's uh, just as well as people within the region, which also makes J-Labs a great partner for you since they have a national footprint. Uh, Artie, let's talk about TEDCO. Uh, a lot of people already know about TEDCO. There may be some uh, people on the webinar that don't know a lot about TEDCO. Let's talk about who's eligible to come to TEDCO for the portfolio of programs you have available you know, must you be a Maryland resident or how much, what percentage of your company has to be here or research is done in Maryland. So, uh, or can you work with people outside of Maryland? So let's just give a basic primer to an introduction to TEDCO and who can work with you. So TEDCO um, is funded by the state of Maryland. So it, we use yours and mine taxpayer dollars to fund uh, the projects and uh, companies, invest in companies uh, throughout the state of Maryland. 
So obviously our projects and uh, most of our projects and our companies need to be residents of the state of Maryland. Um, now, having said that, there are multiple different pro uh, programs under the TEDCO umbrella, and each can have a little bit of a twist on what the eligibility criteria would be. Uh, before I go into describing a little bit of that, I um, strongly suggest everybody go to our website, um, tedcomd.com, and there's a button called Get Started. Click on that and it takes you to an assessment tool. There's another button saying take the assessment. And that's probably the easiest way to sort all the programs and figure out which programs and resources you would be eligible for. Um, now, having said that, so we have multiple programs. We have programs that are specifically um, towards, uh, you know, uh, for rural area, companies in rural areas. There are companies that are uh, uh, financially disadvantaged or socially disadvantaged founders, and those are, they come through the, what is called the Builder Fund. That has an accelerator kind of model, so we do have executives that will work with those companies to get them to be more eligible for our seed and venture funding. The MI program, like I said, is look only working with our partner universities, but there's also the stem cell grant program, which is looking at regenerative medicine, and that is one program where we do invest in companies outside of Maryland to do clinical research or research in Maryland. So the companies could be in California or in Boston, but they may be doing a clinical trial in one of the Maryland hospitals, including the NIH Clinical Center, or they could be uh, doing some amount of research work in one of the universities in Maryland or collaborating with another company in Maryland. So uh, the dollars end up staying in Maryland, but the companies applying could be outside of Maryland. So, uh, so uh, as I said, there's a whole variety of eligibility for um, different programs within the TEDCO umbrella. And the best way to do, go about looking at it is to just go and browse our website. We tried to make it as simple as possible and not drown you in our alphabet soup of programs. So it should be good enough. Also, we're gonna give them your email address at the end of yes. this so that they, they won't drown if they come to you directly, right, Artie? Right, and, uh, and that is true for any of the TEDCO employees. We are only very, very small. We are only about 20 of us in the office and you can reach any one of us. Our, our information is very public. You can reach any of us and we will direct you to the right fund manager to work with. Great, thanks Artie. Uh, I'm monitoring the questions as they're coming in and one of them uh, was related, Sally, to J-Labs and it's uh, how does J-Labs engage with other resources, uni for example, universities in the ecosystem to support innovation and source potential clients that would be coming out of universities and not already an existing company that may exist that wants to get involved with, with uh, J-Labs? Yeah, and we, we certainly look at companies at, at all stages and are interested uh, with very early discovery, uh, companies working very early discovery all the way through uh, companies in, in the clinic. Um, so yes, we engage across the region. Um, I'm in constant communication um, with tech transfer offices, um, innovation groups at different universities. You know, I think it looks... Um, different depending on the research institute or in university that you're working with. Um, but that's, that's part of, of, of what we do is, is, is we are landscaping, sourcing, um, even working with accelerators uh, where it makes sense for companies to come out of accelerators and, and move into our incubator um, with some, you know, giving the, the company some time to um, have some proof of concept data um, have uh, some funding under their belt, whether that's uh, SBIR funding, friends and family, something small to, to they're in a good, good stage to move in, into our incubator. Um, yeah, we have certainly engaged across the region and, um, and, and meet with uh, universities and, and institutes. So the best way to get that is to come to you directly and say, hey, we've got something here at the University yeah. of Maryland we'd like to sh introduce to you and your door's always open, right? Absolutely. Yes. Right. Um, and, and as mentioned, um, we look at, at everything collectively. So it's, if it's not something that is the right fit for JLabs, our incubator, 
uh, we want to look at it for Johnson and Johnson Innovation and potential partnering with J and J. Super. Uh, I want to go into the, the most popular topic of every webinar that ever is attended by early stage companies, and that's looking for money. And so I want to talk to the experts here. If I'm an early stage life science biohealth company in the in the biohealth capital region, what are your recommendations right now uh, for those entrepreneurs and how they should position, package, and approach investors uh, for money today? And has anything changed in the way that they need to approach people based on the environment we're in today? But how do people who need money, uh, how do they need to pe present themselves? How do they get access to the capital? And uh, is there anything they need to modify their behavior based on the pandemic today? And I'm gonna start with Chris. And that's Chris Thank Barrow you. with JP Morgan. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, this is what we deal with every day. Um, I was on a call yesterday with uh, three separate companies all looking for capital. Um, so, and the first thing is, um, you obviously have to have an idea, you have to have a technology, you have to have it thought out properly. The thing that we're looking for is a short 15 page deck that explains the business model, explains the timeline in terms of what kind of capital. Um, and this is just really a teaser for investors. And so this is, this is to get people on board and say, hey, you got an interesting product, you have an interesting market segment that you're targeting. It looks like you have something that, uh, that is differentiates yourself. Um, and then you have to be realistic in terms of how much it will cost. You have to go through the process of thinking about your budgets. Uh, um, you wanna make sure that you've itemized and thought through all this process. I had someone come in yesterday at the startup company and said we wanna raise $75 million and, and we need that money to get to commercial cash flow positive. And well, we said, look, <laughs> that's nice. But let's take a step back and let's think of the steps that you need to get there first and how much does that cost. Um, and so, you know, JP Morgan's a good resource for that. You know, it, it's always better to make a mistake in front of us than in front of a, a potential investor. Um, and, and, and the other thing in front of investors, be honest. If you don't have the answer, we'll go back and get it. Don't, don't try and make it up. Uh, uh, and and, and, and the, other, the other thing I would say is, um, everyone's worried about dilution and our thing is it's better to own a small piece of a big pie versus a big piece of a, 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 a small pie. So dilution's a concern, but that shouldn't be the fact of driving your, your, your investing capital requirements. Okay. Great, great words of wisdom. And uh, we got three more people to give some advice to people looking for money and Kalela, why don't we go to Kalela next? Uh, sure. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, value assessment is very important very early on um, for startup companies. So when uh, they have an idea, they have to also think about who's going to pay for it. And um, before even uh, presenting to an investor preparing that deck, it's very uh, helpful to go through, um, you know, the process of understanding who the stakeholders interested in paying your products are. And I know that, um, you know, RT is familiar with AdvoMed uh, value assessment tool. And uh, that's a tool that uh, our companies use when we put them through our accelerator program to really start thinking, you know, um, we talk about being a value-based economy for hospitals, but we are not, right? So there are only a handful of hospitals in the country that are truly, um, or maybe, you know, are uh, on their way to becoming uh, value-based, uh, but we're still fee-for-service. Uh, so understanding of, you know, who are uh, the interested parties that pay for your product, uh, understanding of that very early on is very important because it's going to help you um, clearly define your milestones and design your trials and uh, make less mistakes uh, along the way. Thank you, Kalela. Um, Artie, um, let's talk a little bit about what they need to do to get prepared for TEDCO. 
So again, uh, we have many different programs and they go from very early stage when it's just a concept at the university level all the way to venture investment. So we are, we sort of have a pipeline of funding opportunities and you can graduate from one to the other as you go through your fundraising. Um, when you're very early on, we are looking for a little bit more than a proof of concept, not just an idea on the back of a napkin, but you have some research dollars that have gone into that technology to de-risk it, to figure out the, maybe the lead compound or the alpha product for a medical device. And then we provide um, initial uh, dollars in the form of a grant because it's, it's really early on and a lot of these may not be feasible going forward. So we give out grants to de-risk the technology and then as the technology spins out into a startup or there's a startup um, um, that's coming to TEDCO from outside of the university system, there's startups um, off the street that are coming directly to TEDCO, we are work looking at what exactly what um, Chris said. We are looking for a pitch deck, we are looking for um, a, a uh, an understanding of the market, understanding of your customer base. If you are a device, highly recommend what Koala said, the AdvaMed uh, value, um, uh, value of a framework is an awesome, awesome technology, uh, 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 you know, resource for all startups to go through, um, especially if you're a device or a diagnostic. For therapeutics, we are looking at what is your inflection point and how are you going to fund that? Where's your capital going to come from? And uh, in both of those cases, we highly recommend not just looking at the FDA path, but also talking to reimbursement experts very early on. Um, and that sometimes can change the way you plan your um, trajectory for capital raise. So um, we want, we don't, uh, we know that you don't have all the answers and we have resources to provide those answers. Uh, we have experts and, uh, from the ecosystem that we can connect you to, but we want you to have done some of that homework. We don't want you to come to us with uh, a, quite a blank slate. Um, and then uh, if we find that you're lacking or there are gaps in your knowledge or resources, uh, TEDCO is there to sort of connect you to those resources in the ecosystem and elsewhere that you can fill those gaps, including working with BHI and with Rich's group uh, and with uh, JLabs and um, uh, Chris to find all of those networks that we can connect them to. Thank you, Artie. Uh, last but not least, Sally. I, you mentioned an application people have to fill out. That's for the JLabs, but J&J &J is the world's largest pharma company with many different divisions and uh, funding sources. So basic primer for people who want to get engaged with J&J, &J, what do they need to have? Yeah, I, I think we all look at things in with the same lens. I, you know, I think Artie and, and Kalali described it well in, in, in your pitch deck, in your details. Um, what is your next 12 to 24 month project plan look like from where you are today? Um, against uh, the competitive marketplace? Where are you against your competitors? Um, and if you do have uh, funding, what does that runway look like against your project plan? I think we're very interested to understand your time and place now and, and, and your projected milestones as you move forward. Um, and then where are your thoughts on partnering? Why do you want to partner? Um, and uh, or looking at which we can, we also help a lot in is alternative sources of funding, whether that's grant funding, um, supporting our companies uh, in front of our investor hub. But as far as the big J and J, um, yes, it's you know this is why we put our innovation centers on the map um, because it is well, we like to call it the the red front door to Johnson and Johnson. So as we assess the external marketplace uh, for the best science and technology, um, as I'm out here within the DMV region, as I'm assessing opportunities and companies in science and technology, I'm also partnering with um, my business colleagues at, in Boston. And if we want to do a partnership deal, and we do those, we have more than 160, I think, partnership deals with our JLabs companies. Um, I work with my colleagues in Boston and, and we put those partnership deals in place. 
Thank you. And we, we have direct experience with J&J with one of our companies that we introduced to J&J called Benavir yeah. uh, with Matt Mulvey in 2013. So one of the things when people are looking for money or partners, the two words are patience and persistence because they met him in 2013. There was serious due diligence that was done on the company for two years from 2016 to 2018. And then Jay, Janssen division of J&J actually acquired Benavir, but it was a six year process uh, from the time they actually met them to the time that actually something was consummated. So for those out there that uh, want to make payroll next Friday and want to get introduced to an investor, uh, generally it doesn't work that quickly, guys. So uh, be, yeah, I think, be patient. I think it's fair. You're correct. I think it's fair that the things can work a lot faster. And, you know, I think it's time dependent on the science, the technology, um, where we are strategically internally within, with our own portfolio and therapeutic areas. Um, I mean, that was a big acquisition. Big deal. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, um, and we certainly put research and development agreements and partnerships in place um, outside of acquisitions. But, you know, I think it's um, the other thing to, to consider, too, is um, our, our strategies change, too. Right. And especially in, in large corporate pharmaceutical companies are, you know, we have. Um, number of therapeutic areas within Janssen R&D, which is our pharmaceutical arm. Um, our disease area strongholds within those TAs do shift, um, dependent on a lot of different um, aspects. So one year it could be off strategy and the next year it, it, it's back on our strategy. So we, we oftentimes do go back to companies a year later and, and revisit those conversations. Yes, we've experienced that with a lot of the farm and bio companies because if you have a difference or a change in VP of research, uh, all of a sudden the priorities for research within the company and the pipeline change. And uh, it could just take one person to change the whole direction that a company's going to go. You're right, Sally. And, and it's good to revisit uh, on a regular basis because you never know when you're in the sweet spot where before you were on the outside looking in. So... Uh, yeah, thank and the, you. And the marketplace too, right? I think Kalale mentioned how much their telemedicine launched in response to COVID. And I think looking across our marketplace in external innovation, I expect uh, we will see a, a trend, I hope too, in the innovative um, development of new technologies for telemedicine and telehealth. I think that's a big emerging area, especially the pandemic is really uh, reinforcing how important it is uh, to have the remote care and monitoring available for patients. We're starting to get some questions here, and I'm going to ask one to Chris. Someone asked, is there an online JP Morgan portal or program uh, to revisit the information uh, that you're providing? Um, not really. I mean, um, I, <laughs> we have, we have a, we have a lot of information online, but it, it, it's amalgamation of different sources that I'm giving you. Look, I'm happy to jump on the phone or uh, communicate via email, which whatever is the easiest for anybody. Um, uh, I'm happy to, 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 to share the information to places that people want to get connected. So, um, Richie, just let me know when I can share my information and I'll do so. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, well, everybody will get a chance to share their information at the end uh, of the of the webinar. Um, you know, another fifty percent of the people who are attending the webinar are talking about access to capital, and that is the primary need uh, that they have. So, it, it generally that uh, monopolizes a lot of the webinars, and it's it's hard to ignore it. So, I guess the question would be: We talked about what they need to do. What are you seeing as some of the biggest mistakes people make when they are looking for capital that you could help them avoid? And let me start uh, with Sally, and then we'll work our way around. Yeah, I think um, not doing, something I've seen a couple of times already this year is, is not doing the research of understanding where you are against your competitors in the marketplace. Uh, so feeling that you have a science or technology um, that is unique or that you're further along than, or, and not, or not even being aware of, of some other competitors in the marketplace um, that are, are leading. Um, so if, what is your differentiation? So I think that's incredibly important. 
Um, I think other, um, in looking for funding, um, and we've certainly seen a, a, a large increase from what we're hearing working with the NIH and other groups. So SBIR funding applications have gone up. Um, so if you're applying for an SBIR or STTR, my recommendation that uh, is to call those offices and, 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 and get that support and mentorship directly, and they offer that. I think look at alternative potential funding opportunities through grants. Uh, we have and run uh, from JLab's Quick Fire Challenges. Uh, we partner with others uh, like Kalale and an upcoming pediatric pitch event um, and offer um, uh, additional add ons outside of just grant funding, but for instance, um, seats within our incubators as, as winners of, of prizes and awards. So I think. Um, look into alternative bridges sourcing of funding until you can pull in um, a series A or something bigger. I would agree with the 100% and I haven't talked much about BHI, but we do have a federal funding and uh, SBIR pre-proposal assistance program, which has been extremely effective for seven years. So those people uh, looking for non-dilutive funding, uh, we have a great team at BHI that can help you and we have a, almost a 50% success track record of those who work through the system in winning grants. And the, uh, the, the equity uh, players love to get non-dilutive funding into your companies with, uh, because it does not dilute their equity. So uh, we recommend that on a parallel path because generally you can't fund yourself on non-dilutive funding by itself because of the time it takes to get awards granted. So make sure you have a parallel strategy and not be dependent strictly only on non-dilutive funding. Uh, Chris, let's talk about uh, things, the do nots uh, when raising capital. In addition, somebody has said, do you recommend crowdsourcing or have you seen successful companies use crowdsourcing for raising capital in the biohealth space? So two part question there. Yeah, I'll answer the second part first. Uh, I have not seen any crowdsourcing funding in 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 the space we're tackling. Most of the companies we have um, are, you know, raising money initially by friends and family, and then they go to angel investors, and then they do their Series A. So we have not seen any crowdsourced funding. Not to say it's wrong or it wouldn't work, but we just haven't seen it. Okay. Um, the biggest thing that, that we see is, uh, you know, companies say they, they've got the exciting technology and they just saw another company that has, they think, similar technology and they just went public or had a big M&A and therefore their company should be worth X, you know, the same as that company. And I say to them, yeah, yes, your technology may be pretty, pretty compelling, but it's only worth whatever an investor is willing to invest in. So, um, it's not just the technology, it's also the, the, the management team. Um, a lot of times the VCs are, 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 are betting on not just the, the horse, but they're also betting on the jockey. So um, I, 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 I caution people to get overly optimistic about the valuation. Um, I think that that's the one area that we see more frequently than not that you know, companies come out and say, we have an X valuation and they go out and try and raise money based on that valuation. And they they quickly learn that that's not the case. So um, be, try and be as realistic, talk to as many people as possible, try to get a sense of what's out there as, as, as Sally mentioned about your competitors, what's the other technology out there um, and be realistic. Thank you, Chris. Kalela, any quick no, do nots? Um, I'll start with dues, and I agree with Sally, you know, uh, funding is one part, but the benefits that come from some accelerator programs or incubator programs, in addition to funding, is very valuable. And I, uh, okay, do not uh, jump into thinking that VC is the only vehicle, as uh, Chris mentioned, VC is bet. Uh, so try to uh, raise that non-dilutive capital as much as you can to run you for as long as you can um, to become more su successful when you present to a uh, VC. Uh, from our experience uh, 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 through the National Capital Consortium for Pediatric Device Innovation, of the startup companies that we supported over the past seven years, 
um, uh, collectively, they raised follow-on funding uh, of north of $200 million. And that's a very good metric that we show to the FDA to demonstrate the return on FDA dollars, return on federal dollars um, from um, in, uh, accelerator programs such as um, ours, yours, uh, uh, J Labs. Uh, I think that it's very important uh, to think not only funding, but also uh, the mentoring and coaching uh, that comes with it. Great, thanks. Artie, anything that you can add? Um, so one of the biggest uh, pet peeves I have is if they don't talk about their value proposition in terms of dollars, right? So it's one thing to say, okay, this is my device and it's gonna help this many um, patients, but are they really, is that your big patient population? Who's going to be using it? What is your value proposition? And uh, one of the things that we dig into a lot is uh, for our grantees, we work on creating and helping them create that value proposition. And for our companies, we look to see that if, do they have a proper uh, value proposition definition and do they have the right customer that they should be going after? Again, a couple of things that have helped our startups are uh, doing the i uh, program, and that certainly helps you narrow that down and come up with not just the business plan, but also the business um, model for your company, and that certainly helps a lot. Um, and the other, uh, uh, the other thing is exactly what Kalela said, is to get involved in the local accelerator, incubator, or... Uh, in, in this case, I would say uh, come early to TEDCO and talk to TEDCO. We have a lot of other resources other than funding that we can connect you to. And that certainly helps you build that story. And um, as we see over the years, if we see you making those, if you say you're going to achieve certain milestones and we see you achieving, achieving those milestones, it makes a very beautiful story when you do come to us for funding, when you're ready for funding. Uh, we do have a SBIR, SDTR um, a lab proposal lab as well, just like Rich does. We do have, we got some federal funding to help uh, folks um, um, write their proposal and submit it. So we help them as well. This is a brand new program that we are doing at PETCO. Um, in, uh, and uh, in, in terms of how we look at, hey, this is, uh, if we are putting in X amount of dollars, uh, it, the amount of dollars that we may put in even through MI, maybe less, but we work with those companies to improve your valuation. Um, so for the seven years or eight years that we have been in business, we have invested uh, 10 million or so in startups. We have invested a total of 39 million in projects, but 10 million in startups. And they have gone on to raise over half a billion dollars in follow-on funding. And that's a reflection of how we roll up our sleeves and work with our companies because we we invest so early on. So I'm always uh, you know, ha happy to help, even if you're not a Tedco portfolio company, we are happy to help you guys, but um, becoming a Tedco portfolio company definitely has uh, its own perks as well. Thank you, Arnie. We're getting close to the witching hour, but I'm gonna let each panelist basically have a brief uh, closing comment on why the biohealth capital region is the best region for fueling innovation ecosystem for startups. So uh, we'll start with Chris and then work our way around short synopsis on why this is the place to be. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's uh, people on this panel is, is, is clear evidence. Uh, the, the university systems, all the government funding like NIH in, in, in BARDA, they're all within the, in this region. Uh, make it a terrific area to, to, to build businesses. Thank you. That was Chris Barrow, who is the Executive Director of Life Sciences at J.P. Morgan. Thank you, Chris. Now, Kalala Eskadanian, uh, who is the Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer at Children's National Hospital. Kalala? Thanks, Rich. I, I will stole your line. <laughs> you cannot possibly recreate uh, this ecosystem anywhere in the world. Uh, so there is one NIH, one FDA, uh, and we have such a great and rich uh, resource for life science uh, companies in this region. And uh, it's also a great place to live and raise family. Thank you very much. Sally Elaine, who's the head of J Labs in Washington, D.C. Sally, closing comments? 
Yeah, it's it's certainly well put by by Chris and Kalale of of why we landed here and at the first of its kind in uh, Children's National Innovation Campus uh, in Northwest DC. We're excited to to be in an ecosystem uh, where companies can be placed next to research institute academic partners. We're down the street from NIH, the FDA. Uh, so we, we, we recognize the wealth of what's in this environment and ecosystem. And then also the opportunity, which I think is important for all of us in this ecosystem, is to be able to have the hard conversations with individuals on the Hill of what it takes science and technology to move forward and the need for innovation and things like, and our public private partnerships for the health of, of this, this country. Thank you, Sally. Artie? I, um, all of what everybody else said, but I just wanted to leave a couple of examples of how we have leveraged our ecosystem in, the, in just the last few years. And um, both of them happen to be from Hopkins, but one, one of our companies, Glycin, was part of BHI's network. We invested in the company. We de-risked the company in, this, uh, in, the, in the schools, and then we spun out the company. They worked with BHI to get some uh, SBIR funding as well. And then they went to J-Labs and uh, won one of their quick fire challenges. And uh, just last week, they, um, last, last month, they raised $20 million in Series A, which is a, a, a huge big deal for them. It took a few years, but they got there. Another example is Asclepix that was also a Hopkins therapeutic company came through. I don't know if they were part of BHI at all, but uh, they did uh, come to a lot of the events that BHI would hold. Um, and uh, they met Chris and Chris helped them uh, with the banking needs. And, um, and uh, they met one of their lead investors for their series, A. Uh, Brown at the BHI Biohealth Capital Forum that um, Rich uh, hosts. Um, and uh, they were able to raise a uh, $35 million series A just last week again. So it's, uh, I think the strength of the ecosystem is in the fact that we have all these wonderful partners that we can work with and we work collaboratively to get those companies to where they need to be. Great, Artie. You've been a great segue to a future event. Uh, as you know, we normally have the BioHealth Capital Region Forum in April at AstraZeneca, and this year we've had... Uh, move it to October and make it virtual. So October 19th, save the date for everybody, will be a virtual BioHealth Capital Forum. Uh, and we have some fantastic speakers. And then on the 20th and 21st of October, we're gonna have the third annual BioHealth Capital Investment Conference sponsored by Wilson Sonsini and JP Morgan. And a number of the panelists you see on the screen today are also gonna be judges for our Crab Trap competition which we'll be holding. And I think, Sally, I don't know if you remember, you agreed to do that, but uh, we're going to come back to you and ask you to do it again uh, for real on the 21st. And, uh, but anyway, I, I want to thank all the panelists, Chris and Kalala and Sally and Artie. It's been a very informational and educational panel for the people uh, in the BioHealth Capital region, as well as people outside. Thank BioBuzz for sponsoring this. And I think Adam's going to close this with giving us the summary of the polls that were conducted before. And we will promise to answer questions that we didn't answer uh, that you submitted after this. We'll direct them to the individual they directed to. And I'm sure each of the individuals will be glad to answer those questions that were asked of them that we didn't cover. And lastly, Adam, uh, could everybody give their email address for contact? And I'll start Chris, please. Sure. It's uh, christian.barrow, B-A-R-R-O-W, at jpmorgan.com. Kalela? It's kskenda at childrensnational.org. Great. Sally? So selane2 at its.jnj.com. Artie? No, you're no, you're, mute, you're, you're muted. It's a centenum at tedco.md, but I just put my email in the in the chat box. Great. Good just idea. So everybody, everybody gets it. And I'm R. Bendis at biohealthinnovation.org. Now we'll turn it back to Adam. Thank you much to everybody, and Adam can close. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to also add, if, if you did happen to miss somehow the contact information, that's how we put this together today. I, uh, I hunted down a lot of these people on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's a powerful tool. And as you can see, 
we've got some great experts locally that are willing to share their time. So um, encourage you to be creative and resourceful in your outreach efforts. But, you know, we're not enjoying live events like we used to. Um, at BioBuzz, we have held monthly events for the past decade where if you were lucky, you got to enjoy a conversation like you did today in person, um, you know, and, and we look forward to holding those again in the future. But until then, wow, just thank you again to all the panelists for your time today. Some great tips that have been shared. We will be doing a recap of this. You'll be able to um, have further outreach after the event as well. So there's also gonna be a survey before you exit. So please, we'd appreciate just taking a moment. It's uh, a couple questions so that we can continue to enhance the value of these events and you know, make your experience worth your while. If you enjoyed this webinar as well, please visit biobuzz.io to read and watch recaps from our past events. Uh, previous events have been Venture vs. the Virus, which also talked about funding opportunities and investment and attracting talent in the biohealth capital region for those that are hiring and employers that care about employer branding and how you can find and be a magnet for talent that's going to stick with you. So again, thank you all for the time today, Rich, all the panelists, thank you so much for participating. Thank you to all the attendees. And with that, be well and until next time. Hey, Adam, you do so you have much. the results of the poll? I thought you were going to give some. Ah, here, yes. Uh, I almost forgot about that. So okay. if you want to look at it, we will be sharing these in the recap. Uh, but if you want to take a quick look, here's the results from what best describes you. So if you're looking at that, you can see the majority on the call, entrepreneurs. So you're in good company. We have a good mix of other. So those are either people that are shy and, and not necessarily going to share who they are or what they might actually be doing. Um, we've got several entrepreneurs who have been part of previous ventures, as well as some investors. So, you know, we had a great mix as far as who was on the call. And if we look at some of the stages from those participants, you can see here, um, you know, again, uh, currently seeking funding. Uh, 33%. We had a bunch more people respond as, as other, but um, as with most of the webinars that we've been holding, there's a good mixture there, but the large driver is early stage companies that are looking for not just funding, but again, opportunities to be successful. And that was the whole point of this uh, event. So I think we've had some great uh, ideas shared and opportunities. So I encourage you all to pursue them. And, you know, BioBuzz and Workforce Genetics, you can reach out to us as well. We are part of this ecosystem and our job is to help it succeed. So thank you again to everyone for participating and we look forward to supporting your growth in the future. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.